Hello everyone, Victor from OrganicChemistryTutor.com is here and in this video I want to talk about the radical halogenation of alkanes. We'll go over the intricacies of this uh, entire mechanism, how to find the major products in our reaction and discuss the most important point of each mechanistic step. So here are a couple of simple examples that I have in this reaction. In the first case uh, we replace uh, the hydrogen on our methane molecule with the Br atom and in the second case we're also going to be replacing one of the hydrogens with the chlorine. Also in this case we are going to form a side product HBr in the first case and HCl in the second case. Uh, the radical halogenation is a substitution reaction and it works sort of like a double displacement if you like to think about it this way. So here is a slightly more complicated example where we have multiple potential places for the halogen to substitute the hydrogen. Notice that although it may look like you're just adding a halogen to your molecule when we use the skeletal structures here, in reality we are replacing one of the hydrogens that was in the uh, position where the bromine right now is. So for instance if I look at my first carbon over here I have three hydrogens on it and one of those hydrogens has been replaced by the bromine atom while the other two hydrogens are still there. However, since we are dealing with the uh, skeletal structures over here, those hydrogens are implicit and they do not need to be shown. Which means that I can show my molecule just like that without showing those extra hydrogens, assuming that uh, we all know that those hydrogens are still there. Also, we can potentially, while we can potentially get all these products in uh, this last reaction, in reality we are not going to get uh, all of them in the same quantity. In reality we are going to have one major product here with about 80% uh, yield and we're going to have a couple minor ones and some traces for the rest. But before we go and discuss why that's the case, let's start by looking at the mechanism of the radical halogenation and uh, look at the details of all of those uh, steps in the radical uh, mechanism. So unlike many other mechanisms in organic chemistry, this one is going to have quite a few unique features. And the first step in a radical reaction is going to be the initiation step. We make new radicals in this step uh, in the place where we had no radicals before. Typically, we'll have the halogen uh, that we want to use in our reaction split into two radicals. And upon heating it or using the high intensity like, uh, light, uh, we are going to form two free radicals. Notice that in this case I'm using the half arrows or fish hook arrows if you like to call them this way. So one arrow over here and the other arrow over here mean that one electron from this bond will end up with one of the bromines while the second electron in this bond will end up with the second uh, election. This is a unique feature of the radical reaction, so always remember that whenever you are showing the movement of just a single electron, you're always going to use the uh, fish hook arrows or half arrows, if you like to call them this way. And in this step, as I mentioned, we form free radicals. And a free radical is a neutral species that, is, uh, that has an unpaired electron in its valence shell. So we can see that we have one bromine atom over here with an unpaired electron and we have the second bromine atom also with an unpaired electron. And since the species with uh, incomplete valence shells are not stable, free radicals are going to be quite reactive as well. Now, why exactly does the halogen split into two radicals? The halogen-halogen bond is relatively weak compared to the other bonds that we see in our typical organic molecules. So for instance the Br-Br bond is actually almost twice as weak as the carbon-carbon bond or significantly even more so than carbon-hydrogen bond. 
This is a general trend you're going to see uh, for many bonds that are made by the electronegative elements. So whenever you have two electronegative elements bond to each other, like let's say two oxygens or two halogens or uh, occasionally two nitrogens, and they're bound with a single bond, that bond is not going to be very uh, stable. And most of those bonds are quite weak uh, to the point that they will tend uh, to break easily upon heating or irradiation with the intensive uh, UV light. By the way, whenever we are writing those reactions, we can write the word heat or we can show the little delta symbol that symbolizes heat as well, or we can show this H nu, where H stands for the Planck constant and nu, the Greek letter, stands for the frequency. So when we say H nu, that means light. It's sort of like a chemical shortcut, uh, where, uh, the way we uh, write that. So once we have our uh, free radicals in the system, the next thing that we are going to do is going to be the propagation cycle. And the propagation cycle actually consists of two steps. The first step in the propagation cycle is the uh, halogen radical abstraction. Uh, and uh, the halogen radical is going to abstract one of the hydrogens in our molecule and uh, in this step we are going to see the formation of the side product which is the HBr in this particular case. Next we are going to have a reaction with another molecule of the halogen and in this step we are going to uh, generate our halogenated product and we are going to regenerate one of our Br dots that goes back into the cycle. So you can think about this reaction as a continuous, never-ending cycle that keeps on uh, going and going and going. But you may wonder at this point, why we don't just react the uh, radical that we have for our organic molecule over here with the another Br dot that we have floating around, right? Well. In reality, we have a very low concentration of those uh, Br dots. And uh, so it's highly unlikely that our organic radical meets one of those Br dots in the solution. It's not entirely impossible, don't get me wrong, but the probability of it is extremely low. Thus, the propagation works as sort of like the endless engine constantly cycling through the steps of the hydrogen abstracting uh, by one Br radical and regenerating the new Br radical in the next step. Eventually, we are going to get, uh, to get to the point where some of those radicals will meet each other in space. As I said, this uh, process is unlikely, it has a very low probability, but it can still happen. At that point, we'll have a termination step. So the termination step is when you kill your radicals, is when you recombine radicals into neutral molecules again. So the termination step is literally two random radicals hitting each other in a recombination step and uh, combining those together. This step can give you a lot of interesting molecules. However, as I've mentioned a moment ago, we have a very low concentration of those radicals in our solution, and at any given time, the chances of them meeting are extremely low. This also means that although you can get the product uh, of your reaction uh, through the termination step, like what I'm showing over here, uh, I'm getting the product of my reaction, and although I can get it, you should never show the formation of the final product via the termination step on the test. The majority of your product is always going to be coming from the propagation cycle and not from the termination step. All right, so now when we know all the steps in the radical halogenation mechanism, let's look at the energetics of each of those steps. And the first step in the halogenation uh, reaction is the halogen dissociation. And that step is always going to be endothermic. Any bond breaking process is always going to be endothermic. I repeat, the bond breaking is always endothermic process. It's always going to require energy. The next step, however, uh, the hydrogen abstraction, well, that one can be either endo or exothermic depending on the halogen we have in our reaction. When we have the bromination, that is going to be an endothermic process. However, for the chlorination, it is going to be an exothermic process. 
And the last two step is the formation of the carbon halogen bond. And the bond formation is generally going to be an exothermic process. And finally, the determination step is also going to be an exothermic process in either case, uh, because uh, it's uh, bond formation. So why is this an important thing to consider? Well, the reason why we look at those reaction energies is to understand the overall reaction energy profile and how it may influence the reaction. So in the case of bromination over here, the formation of the uh, carbon radical is the uh, rate determining step. It's the slowest step in the reaction and it has the highest activation energy as well. While in the case of the chlorination reaction, the uh, formation of the carbon radical is not the most energy intensive step. This means that in the bromination, the structure and the stability of the radical are quite important, while in the chlorination, it has much less of an impact uh, on the reaction outcome. And this plays a huge role in the regioselectivity of the radical halogenation. So let's look at the example similar to what I showed at the very beginning of this video. Here we have a molecule and upon halogenation, this molecule can give you several different constitutional isomers. And if the reaction proceeds in a purely statistical manner, we're going to see the following distribution of our products, where the numbers uh, correspond to the number of hydrogens in each of the position that can be substituted by the halogen. So for instance, in the first case, we have two identical methyl groups. So since each methyl group contains uh, three hydrogens, we have six hydrogens overall that we could uh, potentially substitute here. The rest of uh, our hydrogen containing groups are unique as well. So we have one hydrogen here, or we have two hydrogens over here, and uh, we have uh, uh, three hydrogens in our last methyl group over there. So we can also represent this distribution via the percentages like this. And the reality is a little bit more interesting. In reality, this is not observed like this. So what's the deal here? Well, first, it's the radical stability. Since we have uh, a radical intermediate that we form in the propagation uh, step, uh, we need to look at its stability. And the uh, resonance stabilized radicals, like let's say benzylic or allylic structures over here, those are going to be the most uh, stable radicals. Then we have the tertiary radical. It's the radical on the carbon which is connected to three other carbons. Then we have the secondary radical, which is less stable than tertiary. And then we have uh, primary radicals, which are the least stable. The intermediate stability is something that we generally want to consider in a reaction, not just this reaction, but generally in any organic reaction, simply because the more stable the intermediate, the lower the activation energy in the reaction. And since the activation energy is inversely proportional to the reaction rate, the lower the activation energy, the faster the reaction. Thus, the formation of the tertiary radical proceeds faster than the formation of the secondary or primary ones, simply because the tertiary radical is more stable. This together with the energetics of uh, the steps that we have discussed a moment ago, explains the average halogen selectivity towards different positions in the molecule, or in other words, the regioselectivity of the reaction. So chlorine is about three times uh, more selective towards the secondary carbon and about five times more selective towards the tertiary ones. Or you can think about it uh, from the perspective that the chlorine reaction or the chlorination reaction, uh, the secondary radical forms three times faster in that reaction than the primary radical or the tertiary radical forms five times as fast as the uh, primary radical in the chlorination reaction. When it comes to the bromination, though, we have a drastically different picture. Bromination is approximately 80 times uh, more selective towards the secondary position and roughly 1600 times more selective uh, towards the tertiary position. Now, 
it doesn't mean that the bromination is a faster reaction and contrary is actually a slower reaction. But these numbers are the relative rates for each reaction. So we can compare the chlorination between uh, the different atoms. We can compare the bromination between the different atoms. But we cannot compare the chlorination to bromination using those numbers. Just so we're clear on that part. So how does that now play into the regioselectivity? If we now take the statistical probabilities of uh, uh, what we already know by looking at the number of hydrogens in each position and multiply those by the relative reaction rates for each halogen, we'll get a more realistic distribution of our products. Thus, for reaction with the chlorine, we get approximately 25% uh, for the uh, tertiary product instead of the 8% which we had there from the purely statistical perspective. If we do the same manipulation for the bromine, however, we get a hugely different numbers. Uh, for the reaction with bromine, we get almost 90% uh, of the tertiary product and just a little bit of the rest, uh, about 10% of one of the secondary products and uh, less than 1% uh, for our primary products, so just, you know, little traces. So... This is an important thing here because while the chlorination uh, reaction, uh, while in the chlorination reaction, all possible products will form to an appreciable extent, uh, the uh, tertiary chloride may not even be the uh, major product there. While in the bromination reaction, the reaction is going to be extremely selective uh, towards the formation of this uh, tertiary bromide. Now let's look at a few more examples uh, before we go any further. And looking at my first reaction here, I can see that I have three different positions uh, where the substitution can occur. I have two methyl groups on the sides that are identical to each other. I have two methylene groups in the middle. Then I have a CH3 in the middle and I finally have a CH over here. So due to the internal symmetry, this part of the molecule and this part of the molecule are essentially the same. So if I put the bromine in one position like this, it is going to be exactly the same as putting this bromine into the second position like that. Which means that I get um, these uh, following products where all four possible uh, positions have been substituted at some point. And uh, here we can also see that since the, uh, this is a bromination reaction, we can easily say that the tertiary bromide is going to be the major product in this reaction. So the tertiary position is over here, where the carbon with the bromine is attached to three other carbons. So this one is going to be our major product in this case. So. Here is another example. Uh, this molecule also has some symmetry, so some of the positions around the molecule will be identical. Uh, pause this video now and give it a go. And once you are ready, resume this video and check your answer. All right, so here we have three possible products in this case. And again, the tertiary product is going to be the major product in this reaction. So the tertiary atom is over here and that is our uh, major product. So finally, let's look at this example over here. I'll give you a few moments to work on this uh, example as well. So pause this video and uh, resume it when you are ready to check your answer. So here we have four possible products and like in the previous case, since it's a bromination reaction, the tertiary halide is going to be the major product in this case as well. However, we also have a couple of uh, secondary 
uh, products in this case that are going to be approximately the same in their uh, quantity. So those are going to be our major, uh, sorry, minor components. And finally, we have uh, the uh, primary product, which is going to be just in the trace amounts here. I purposefully chose the bromination for these three examples as it is a selective process and it's the most common type of halogenation you're going to see on the test. In most cases, even if you see the chlorination, your instructor will probably expect you to show the tertiary product as the major product. Unless, of course, they went through the details uh, of the regioselectivity for each halogen like we did. Some instructors do, some instructors don't. So pay very close attention to how your instructor likes to treat the radical halogenation uh, during the lectures. And I think it's going to be it for this video. If you want to learn more, check out the links in the description below. I'll see you next time, and until then, remember to stay awesome!